Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. In this video, we'll talk about adaptive immunity. So this video would include these following points. We'll talk about the cellular players of the adaptive immune system. We'll talk about the time and place of adaptive immune response, phases of the adaptive immune response and how adaptive and the innate immune response is bridged by several molecular players. So this is what we are going to learn at the end of this video. So stay tuned till the end of this video. Now let us look at first the players of the adaptive immune system. They are simply the major players are T cell and the B cell which are developed from the lymphoid progenitors present in the bone marrow. Now in my earlier video I have already talked about the innate immune system components which has eosinophil, basophil, neutrophil, NK cells, mast cells etc and also macrophages and dendritic cell. Now the important part about the macrophages and the dendritic cell is they can be a connection between these two immune responses innate and adaptive. Now the dendritic cell takes special part connecting uh, in connecting these two systems in this video we can appreciate that so let's look at the overall framework of adaptive immune system how does it work so it's kind of like a second line of uh, mechanism for uh, attacking the pathogens so let's say these pathogens have invaded our body they could be viruses they could be bacteria so first of all when they enter in order of hours to in order of one days the dendritic cell or macrophages as they are phagocytotic they would act upon them and try to engulf those pathogens so the innate immune response if we briefly describe they would recognize the pathogen they would engulf the pathogen and they would inform the adaptive immune system about these pathogen invasion so they provide the adaptive immune system these kind of intel about the pathogens now after they recognize the pathogen and try to try their best to neutralize the pathogen. They some of these innate immune system components, such as the dendritic cell, actually establish connection between adaptive and innate immunity, and they migrate towards the uh, lymph node where the adaptive immune components reside, and they inform them about the in, in, uh, infection history. So. Uh, active connection between adaptive and innate immune system is very important for a successful immune response to happen. So let us look at a case study and try to understand with a real example. Let's say we are pricking our hand with a nail and, and accidentally this is a rusty nail which had a lot of bacteria along with it. So the bacteria has entered our body. Now obviously the macrophages, the dendritic cell which are just beneath the skin would quickly try to engulf those pathogens. Now, first of all, before engulfing, they would recognize them, then they would engulf them. So let's look at a dendritic cell to understand this process. So the dendritic cell would engulf the pathogen, then this pathogen would be fusing with a lysosome and the endolysosome would be formed where the pathogen would be degraded. Ultimately, the degraded peptides derived from this pathogen would be displayed on class 2 MHC molecule such that these can be presented to the T cells or the adaptive immune components such that they know about the history of invasion. So the macrophages and dendritic cell would secrete cytokines and that would attract other cells in a near vicinity to come closer and fight with them, right? As if they are calling for backup. Some of these dendritic cells would be motile and they would migrate towards the lymph node. And very important events of the adaptive immune system is taking part, place in the lymph node. So in the lymph node, the immature B cell, which is naive B cell, which has all the capability of recognizing the pathogen or producing antibodies would eventually be activated. So these innate, so these innate immune system components activates the adaptive immune components. So let us look at this process in a bit more details by zooming into a component inside the lymph node. So here we zoom into the lymph node and we can see the germinal center or the follicles for the B cell area and paracortex where T cell resides. Now 
what happens is when the B cells are activated, they proliferate rapidly, increasing their number. Some of them could be quickly differentiated into short-lived plasma cells, and some of them can be really differentiated to uh, long-lived plasma cell. We'll come to that. And everything is dependent upon what type of antigen B cell is encountering. Now, B cell activation could be via T cell, and those are known as uh, T cell dependent antigens. So in this case, T cell and B cell interaction leads to very strong B cell activation. But B cell don't really, uh, really require T cell for its activation. B cell can be activated in an individual format. So B cell can be activated by repetitive antigens as shown here, or by directly via toll-like receptor, or let's say by directly recognizing a portion of the pathogen, but these are relatively weak degree of uh, activation for the B cells. No matter what way they are activated, eventually they would start the cell cycle process and they would proliferate in number, they would increase in number. So obviously, let us assume that a T helper cell is activating a B cell and these uh, T helper cell is actually a follicular T cell. In a different video, we'll talk about follicular T cell in a lot more details. But let's say this follicular T cell ha has activated this B cell. So immediately, this B cell can generate short-lived plasma cells and secrete the specific membrane-bound IgM, sorry, the secretory IgM into the bloodstream, such that uh, the effector molecules are already in the bloodstream. That's a relatively quick response. But for a long-term one, the B cell can be proliferating in the follicles, and then it can differentiate into antibody secreting plasma cells, which is long lived. And these plasma cells would be residing for several weeks to months. So let us look at this process in a bit more details to understand the kinetics of it. So in the B cell follicle, the B cells which are activated are now proliferating. The B cells, which has very high affinity of receptors, or very high affinity of antibodies, they would be surviving. Otherwise, which have very low affinity antibodies, they would be dead by apoptosis. Now, the low affinity interactions can be um, modulated, or there is a cell known as follicular dendritic cell, which can uh, rectify these kind of low affinity interaction and try to rescue this. If they are rescued, then it would, if the low affinity problem is solved, then they are rescued and they are differentiated to plasma cell, otherwise they are dead. So few important events of adaptive immune response takes place in this B cell follicle via the, uh, I mean, or the germinal center. Those are somatic hypermutation, which are mutations that can lead to increase or decrease in affinity of the B cell uh, membrane bound antibody. Now, obviously the high affinity antibodies would be selected. The B cells which are having high affinity antibody would be selected and the low affinity one would be deleted or, or by apoptosis. So the high affinity ones would be differentiated eventually to the plasma cells. And this process is known as somatic hypermutation. And about somatic hypermutation, I have a different video. So you can click on the I button to watch that. Now, these plasma cells had already done a process which is known as class switching. That means when it was a B cell, it was only able to generate membrane bound IgM or IgD. Now with the class switching process, they can also secrete IgG or other kind of uh, isotypes. So these are the key events that are happening in B cell follicle in the lymph node. And this is a very crucial step in the adaptive immune response. I'll tell you why. So in order to understand that, let us look at the overall time course of the adaptive immune response. Let us go by phase by phase. So first phase is the activation of the uh, adaptive immune components, such as the T cells and the B cells. So T cells can be activated by the antigen presenting cells and the B cells can be activated by the T cells or individually. No matter what, B cell and T cell would eventually proliferate. So there is a recognition phase and there is a clonal expansion phase. Followed by clonal expansion phase, there would be an activatory phase where the T cells are getting activated and also the B cells are getting activated and differentiated into plasma cells. Now, they would start the effector response, either the humoral immune response 
or the cell mediated immune response that would really fight the pathogen. So effector response is a very important stage in these uh, adaptive immune response. But after a while when the issue is resolved and the pathogens are dead, then these elevated level of antibody or elevated level of these activated T cells might be harmful. So they eventually die, right? So they are eventually, they eventually die. Most of them die. So there is a declining phase. So their number would rapidly decline. But some of them do not die. And they form the memory cells. So memory cells are generated in this way. If you want to learn more about the memory cells, there are quite a lot of hypotheses and controversies about memory cell generation. So you can click the link in the I button to learn more about the memory cells. So getting back to the temporal kinetics of the immune response. So let us talk about the antibody mediated immune response, which is also under adaptive immune response and try to understand the kinetics. So this is how the antibody response look like. So the red one, is IgM level and the yellow one is actually IgG level and the white arrow denotes the time course of the pathogen exposure. So when the pathogen is exposed, after 10 days, it turns out that IgM antibodies would be produced and after 20 days, approximately IgG antibodies would be produced. So these time points are approximate. So it takes 10 to 14 days to produce IgM, secretory IgM firstly. Now, there is a lag, right, from the day of exposure to the antibody in the circulation. There is a lag. And this lag is due to recognition, then presentation to the adaptive component. And thereby only the adaptive component can uh, make the antibody. So this whole process is a lengthy process, so it takes time. But in case of a secondary immune response, this lag is relatively low. Within a course of three days, the IgM can be produced and within a course of 10 days, the IgG can be produced. So the second time when the same pathogen is invading our body, the immune response is faster and higher in magnitude. This is because the memory B cells, after primary infection, most of these cells die, but some of them leave, which becomes the memory B cell. Broadly speaking, this memory B cell have a memory of the pathogen that had invaded, the particular memory which is encoded in the molecular level. In the second time invasion, they just need to recall that what type of antigen they had encountered in past and they can quickly differentiate into antibody secreting plasma cells and secrete the antibody necessary to neutralize that pathogen. So that is why in the secondary immune response, the lag is so short. The key aspect of the secondary immune response is generation of the memory cell. That's a key response. So just to summarize this video, we learned the cells that are involved in adaptive immune response, the overview of the adaptive immune system, the phases of adaptive immune response. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this video, give it a quick thumbs up and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Thank you guys. Thanks for listening.